Mr. President. Senator from Oregon. Mr. President, uh, tonight I voted against final passage of the Defense Authorization Bill. And I rise now to explain why I voted against it and the considerable concerns that I have about the vast expansion of the powers of detention of American citizens that were contained in that bill. Now these provisions related to the detention of American citizens without the standard rights of the Fifth and Sixth Amendment have been an object of intense debate on the floor of the Senate over the last several days. As a senator who has now been here three years, I can say unequivocally that this debate was extremely valuable. Folks came from both parties, on both sides of this issue, and shared their insights, both from their life experiences, from their scholarly knowledge of the law, and certainly from their philosophy. And uh, I commend all who participated in that debate. I listened to a great deal of that debate on both sides. And I th thought that this is extraordinarily important. Issues surrounding our Bill of Rights and the rights of American citizen, protection from the abuse of power. Now for some, some came to this floor and said that essentially the detention provisions in this bill simply clarify existing law and will enhance our national security. And they did so with sincere hearts and sharp minds. Others came equally sincere, equally learned, and argued the opposite side, that the detention provisions in this bill constitute a devastating circumvention of the Fifth Amendment right to due process and the Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial by an impartial jury, as well as the Sixth Amendment right to confront the witnesses against him or her. Maybe it's useful to take a look at what it, the Fifth and Sixth Amendment actually say. One of the last clauses of the Fifth Amendment notes that no person shall be, and I quote, deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. I think we all grow up in this country absolutely believing in this fundamental value that the government cannot take from you your life, your liberty, or your property without the process of law. The Sixth Amendment notes that in prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, and I emphasize public trial, by an impartial jury of the state. And it goes on to note that the accused shall be able to confront the witnesses against him and to have the assistance of counsel. So these basic issues of speedy and public trial an impartial jury, the assistance of counsel, and the ability to confront the witnesses against you. All of these contained in the Sixth Amendment and all relevant to this debate over detention. So most of this conversation is about a section of the bill called Section 1031 in subtitle D, and it's referenced subtitle D, Detainee Matters. And I'll just read the title of the section to give a, a sense of what this is all about. Section 1031, Affirmation of Authority of the Armed Forces of the United States to Detain Covered Persons pursuant to the authorization for use of military force. Now it uses this fancy word, covered persons, and it is what is referred to in everyday speech as enemy combatants. So section 1031 is about the ability of the armed forces to detain enemy combatants. 
Now, the reason this is framed this way is that there is a historical exception under constitutional findings of the Supreme Court to Amendment 5 and Amendment 6 of the Constitution. And that exception is that if an individual is fighting on the side of the enemy against the United States, that they do not have the same rights because they are now an enemy combatant in time of war. And they can be detained for the duration of that conflict. And this uh, was adjudicated in World War II over individuals who assisted uh, with sabotage in New York. And it was found that the standard uh, rights, a speedy public trial, trial of jury, right to counsel, do not apply if you're an enemy combatant. Instead, you're put into the framework of a war setting to be treated as a member of the opposing army. So this exception has historically been extremely narrow. You are on the battlefield, or you are directly working as a member of the enemy force against the United States. It should be extremely narrow. And it should be substantial hurdles for the state to be able to simply claim that you're an enemy combatant and thereby strip you of your Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. But what we have in this bill, in Section 1031, is not this narrow set of provisions based on the historical understanding of an enemy combatant. Instead, we have a definition that says, and I will read it to you, a person who was a part or substantially supported Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces engaged in hostilities against the U.S. or coalition partners, including any person who has committed a belligerent act or has directly supported such hostilities in aid of enemy forces. And on first reading, it may sound like that individual who is directly involved in combat, but listen to the words embedded in this. First of all, it says a part of, with no conception of what a part of meaning means. Did you write one sympathetic email in your lifetime? Does that make you a part of? We have no standard here. Substantially supported is understood to mean material support, but no contingency for intent. If you donated money to a charity, and that charity used it to support Taliban activities somewhere in the world, or some other group that had an association with Taliban, you have substantially supported under this conversation. Then it says the U.S. or its coalition partners. Who are these coalition partners? What's the definition of that? Now, a few weeks ago, you might have noticed in the news that there's a lot of protests going on in Bahrain. Well, we have a military facility in Bahrain. Is Bahrain a coalition partner since we utilize a partnership with them to supply our forces in the Middle East? Yes, probably so, because there's no definition of coalition partners. Well, would individuals who were standing up for human rights and got into a battle with police in a public square, they are engaged in a belligerent act against a coalition partner. So I hope you can start to see that the standard understanding that has been constitutionally established over time is completely taken apart in this simple paragraph. That should be of grave concern to all Americans who care about our constitutional rights to a fair hearing. Now, so what happens when the government suspects that you have done something? And I want to take you to a case in Oregon. We had a case regarding an individual named Brandon Mayfield. Now, Brandon Mayfield was born in Kansas 
Brandon Mayfield got his law degree in Topeka, Kansas. Brandon Mayfield is an Army veteran. Brandon Mayfield is married with three children, lives with family in Topeka suburb. Well, Brandon Mayfield is a Muslim convert. And in 2004, FBI agents raided his law office, his home, his family farm to collect evidence, believing that he was a terror mastermind behind the Madrid bombings. Now, the reason why is an FBI agent concluded that a partial fingerprint matched Brendan Mayfield's fingerprint. Under this framework, the government now labels him an enemy combatant. And what right does Brandon Mayfield have to contest this? Well, basically, no rights. The law provides only that there will be a hearing, that the rules of the hearing will be set by the executive branch, by the president, if you will, that the attorney will be assigned by the executive branch, that the rules of evidence will be determined by the executive branch, that this hearing will occur sometime, but when? We don't know. No right to a, a speedy trial. No commitment that it will be public. In other words, no protections from the force of the state whatsoever. Completely opposite. So this gateway around the Fifth and Sixth Amendments is very loosely defined rather than tightly defined. And then the entire process by which an individual might try to say, you're wrong, that wasn't me, I wasn't there, is extraordinarily without powers for the defendant. I find that outrageous. Because once that hearing occurs, possibly in secret, without an attorney that the, the individual would like to employ without rights to evidence, without an ability to confront the witnesses against him or her, without any of these rights, that person can now be locked away forever under this law. No right to appeal, no right to contest, and therefore this completely works against the principles we hold dear. Because those principles were set up the Fifth Amendment and Sixth Amendment were set up to defend us against the overreach of an executive branch. And yet we have stripped away tonight those protections. A lot of the conversation over the last few days has noted that there was a historical gate in through which you did not have the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, but also recognized how narrow that was. And what we have done today changes that. I hope that this continues to receive substantial attention. I would have hoped that there had been hearings about this phenomenal change in U.S. law adopted here tonight because this sort of thing should not be done lightly it should not be placed at the last second into a defense authorization bill without extensive consideration extensive testimony by experts on all sides of this issue there is another feature of this bill that I think deserves attention and that is that it creates a presumption for certain types of crimes to be held in criminal courts, tried in criminal courts, excuse me, tried in military tribunals rather than in civilian courts. Now many of my colleagues are much more familiar with this than I am. But they've come to this floor and they have noted that 300 individuals 
who have been accused of terrorist-related crimes have been tried in civilian courts and found guilty versus six in military courts. They have noted that because the FBI is immersed in the process of getting evidence out of individuals, they are masters at it, which helps to explain these 300 convictions versus the six in military courts. But the law tonight creates a presumption that you'll be tried in military court under an argument that several of my colleagues have made that simply the military are better at it. But not one shred of evidence brought that the military are better and lots of evidence about the sophisticated, experienced, systematic, and successful efforts of the FBI. So colleagues, Mr. President, I would like to conclude by summarizing that all that we hold dear as Americans in this Constitution about our fair rights as citizens has been trampled on tonight. That this has happened twice before in this chamber and the Supreme Court has thrown it out twice before. I hope that they will find a case that this will put before the court again because it is the responsibility of the court to keep taking us back to this document, this Constitution, when we waver from the course it lays out. It should not be a situation that the government can simply assert that the president, no matter what president it is, this president or any future president, whether it be President Bush, whether it be President Obama, whether it be the next president of the United States or one five presidencies into the future should not be able to say, you, Joe American, I'm calling you an enemy combatant. I am locking you up. I'm assigning your defender, your court attorney, if you will. I'm deciding the rules of evidence. I'm deciding if it's going to be secret. And after I conclude that there's enough evidence because of a partial fingerprint I'm locking you up forever, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Now, Brandon Mayfield was locked up. And he might have been locked up forever if this law had been in place. But the FBI made a mistake. The FBI completely botched the fingerprint comparison. It was Spain that brought it to our attention. Spain kept saying, America, you've got the wrong guy. America, you have the wrong fingerprint. And it was Spain that found the right match. And it was finally our own system said, yes, we made a mistake, and we're setting Brandon Mayfield free. But under what was done tonight, he may never have seen the light of day outside of his prison. And that is not right, and it is not absolutely not a contributor to the security of this country to strip away fair rights of due process, to summon the evidence, to confront your accusers, and make sure that a just decision occurs. Thank you, Mr. President.